And first of all, I'd like to welcome the Mayor of Dorchester, who's going to come up and say a few words to you. Thank you. It's wonderful to address an audience who A, have hair, <laughs> and B, many of you are young enough to have whatever colour your hair is still obvious. <laughs> wonderful. Because, of course, this has been an, a spectacular day and we're here for the summing up and you're not here to listen to the Mayor of Dorchester, but I am incredibly proud to be the Mayor of Dorchester, the county town of Dorset, the first county in the United Kingdom to have its own cop. It will be clear to many of you that we have not only created a record in doing that, but we have done so on what I think we will hear later on was the hottest day in September ever. And you're still being here when it's been so hot is a tribute, and the speakers and so on, but that's more than enough for me. Thank you to everybody who's attended, and thank you to everybody who's organised this. Thank you. So the next bit is a few more thank yous that we're going to do. We've probably thanked everybody at least once, which is only right and proper, but I'm going to formally thank people. First up is our sponsors. Thank you ever so much to Dorset Community Energy, Warrior Agency, Ethica, Dorset Council and Red Shark for your support, uh, both in terms of finances and just generally uh, for the events. It's been much appreciated. Next up are our fantastic volunteers. I'm being so proud of you all who took part and took time out of today to help with us on the event. It could not have happened without you. You've helped it run as smoothly as possible and we really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> and next up are Matt and Russ and the video crew who have been also fantastic behind the scenes and possibly in front of the scenes getting us uh, live streaming sorted and uh, just keeping it all ticking over so big thank you to, to you guys <laughs> also big thank you to the corn exchange staff uh, some of them have been here today but there have been others behind the scenes who have helped us when we've been organizing uh, probably a big shout out to Sam, who I bothered with hundreds of emails about what was going to happen when. Uh, so a big thank you to all those staff. <laughs> and last, but by no means least, a big thank you to you, because obviously this would not have happened <laughs> if nobody had come and contributed. So I really appreciate the fact you've come on possibly the hottest day in September and have stayed to the bitter end. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so now I'm going to hand over to Colin, who's going to summarise how the declaration and pledge sessions went. Colin. Well... <laughs> this was not easy, believe me. I'm going to start with a declaration. Uh, so, some of you were com completely happy to sign it, uh, no problem at all. Uh, but there's a lot of people who are saying that it needs a, a lot more work, uh, a lot of people saying it's not strong enough. Um, and so where do we go from here? Uh, well, I think we're going to, as a, as a team, we're going to have to sit. We're going to have to sit down and work out uh, the next stages. Uh, during the conversations about the declaration this morning, one of the ideas came up was that we could do a people's assembly on the uh, on the declaration. Uh, if we do something like that, then it could well go uh, into the end of the year. Uh, but we need to make sure that it's uh, a Dorchester uh, Declaration 2023, not 2024. Um, 
the questions came up about the declaration. Why, why is it the Dor Dorchester Dec Declaration, not Dorset Declaration? Uh, that's, that's because uh, mimicking the international cops, they're held in a certain place and they become, uh, uh, where was the last one? Like the Paris, Paris cop, for example. Uh, so this is going to be the Dorchester Declaration. Uh, and if there's another one, say it's held in Bournemouth, that would become the Bournemouth Declaration. So it's back to the drawing board in terms of the declaration, uh, but that's us, up to us. But we're going to keep in contact with you all. Keep on bringing your pledges in. If you haven't done your pledges, keep, go, go to the website uh, and put your comments, uh, suggestions there for re rewording and so on. So we can carry on sort of uh, taking them in uh, and working with them. So the pledges were much more straightforward. Uh, there was, so I've tried to block them together into kind of subject matter, if you like. Uh, one, of the, one of the top, uh, the two, two, two forms really. One was what we're going to do on a personal basis. Uh, and then there were kind of more uh, things about uh, pressing our, our leaders, our political leaders, uh, and working, working like that. So the top one that came up was the people making changes to the, the way they travel, for example. Uh, using the car less, uh, fighting for public transport, not taking flights and so on, using the bike more than the car, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, there was uh, people wanting to make their lifestyle changes, like growing their own vegetables more, composting more, improving their soil, planting for wildlife, planting trees, planting for biodiversity and so on, and also encouraging others to do the same. Uh, then the, the other, one of the top three was uh, working at a political level with all the different councils. So the county council, the town councils, and the parish councils. Uh, a, lot, a lot of strong feeling about that. Uh, then there was uh, people sort of making a commitment to start local groups, carry on working with the existing groups and advocate and educate and support uh, people within those groups and the projects that are going on there. Uh, to use money in a sustainable way, uh, divest from fossil fuels, for example, uh, go to banks that are, uh, have a sustainable and a social kind of policy as well, um, and yeah, to use their own money wisely uh, in the right direction. Uh, people talking about taking courage and stepping outside of their comfort zone. It's like there's an urgency now. We need to. We need to step up, like Chris Packham was saying in his address there earlier, earlier on. We need to step out, step up, and uh, and make changes, make new, uh, find new motivations, if you like, find new inspirations, and find new conversations. So it's uh, reaching out to uh, our friends and neighbours and so on, where we might have been a little bit afraid to do that before. Um, People talking about eating less meat, consuming, there's a lot about consuming less uh, in various different ways. One is about less meat, but also in terms of repairing, mending, uh, buying secondhand, uh, following the Green Living Guide, which we've talked about today, uh, in a way of building up our awareness of how we consume and how we can consume less and save money at the same time. Uh, saving, saving energy, in terms of electricity consumption, water com consumption and so on, saving water uh, from the shower to flush the toilet, saving gray, uh, rainwater to uh, water the garden and so on. Um, so that, that's really, really the bulk of it. Um, a, a number of people who are very, very involved already, like Belinda down here, for example. <laughs> Uh, people saying, I'm going to carry on doing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm at capacity already, uh, and that's, that's great. Carry on doing the work you're doing. It's, it's fantastic. People talking about their own businesses or societies that are involved in already, um, trying to get the businesses and societies to uh, challenge planning policies, uh, to consume less, uh, and to build strength within those, uh, those communities or societies. So well done, really, really powerful pledges, and thank you very much indeed for taking the time. Thank you, Colin. 
we're now going to indulge ourselves slightly by each of us giving you our highlight of the day. So uh, I don't know who wants to kick off. I think Giles is going to go first. It should be on. Is it on? <laughs> I feel you should hit up the microphone first. I was going to hand it to Jenny, but I seem to have been caught red-handed. Um, I, I've got a few just little little reminiscences of the day, which, which are just things which caught my eye. Um, I guess the first one was I thought we had a really good session on the, the policy of the view. Um, and then it really lightened off when um, Tobias Selwood stood up at the end and the sparks started flying and we had our first heckler of the, uh, of the uh, conference who asked a very pertinent question about uh, uh, North Sea oil and licences and Tobias went on the defensive. And uh, anyway, it was, it was a really interesting set of dynamics which I thought was uh, added a bit of colour and uh, energy to the whole session. And I hope Tobias isn't too uh, put off from coming back if we ever hold another one of these conferences. Um, uh, Bob Ward, I thought, was a really interesting speaker as well. He gave a couple of uh, really, really clear statements um, and some quite controversial ones that, that may not sort of gel with everybody. He said, you know, if we're serious about tackling climate change, we've got to embrace things like CCS, carbon capture technology because you have to throw everything at it to do it within the time frame. So, uh, you know, I, I think we have to, you know, think about some of the sort of less easy conversations as well as the ones we all agree with. Um, I then went to talk to Colin about the declaration, you've heard all about that. And I then went to do the, um, the, the speaker's corner upstairs, which I thought, again, worked really well, a little, little corner, which was actually more than 70% full most of the time. Lots of interesting stuff, lots of local organisations who just wanted to talk about what they were doing and people were really interested to hear what was going on. Uh, there was a classic statement from the Parks Foundation who said that uh, when they set it up for local groups they just called it Lou Brew and something to do. So, <laughs> nice little, little ditty that one, I must remember that for the future. And I learnt more than I really wanted to know about washing um, environmentally sensitive nappies and how they were delivered around the neighbourhood in EV vehicles to make them even more net zero. So, classic one there, thank you for that. Um, People's Assembly, um, I came at the end of the People's Assembly, the first time I've ever been to a People's Assembly, to my shame, but I was very impressed by the democratic way in which it was conducted and the skill with which it was conducted by everybody. Um, there was a nice thing, but they had this bit about showing a flutter of hands, the jazz hands, which I've only seen online beforehand, not in, in practice. And there was a, a, a comment made about, oh, well, what we really need is proportional representation. And the whole room erupted into this flutter hands, like a sea of butterflies or something, very graphic, very impressive. Um, and then finally, the last session, which was superb, um, I managed to get back down here to talk about nature recovery. And there was all sorts of interesting stuff about uh, you know, one person said, you know, we have to get away from this, we're either meat eaters or we're vegans. There has to be a happy compromise somewhere in the middle. You know, we do need some animals on the landscape for nature recovery. So, uh, some, some great things. And some, a, a lovely statistic that came across that if you put all the gardens together in our houses, it comes to an area that's bigger than the national parks and therefore is essential towards nature recovery. Great suggestion. Sorry, I've spent far too long. Well, thank you, Giles. I think it's covered most points. There's not much left to say here. But we did have, it's been wonderful to engage with you all, to, um, to see how responsive you've been to the um, panel sessions we've had. Because without your questions, you know, that sort of cuts down on a lot of information flowing. Um, I've loved the atmosphere. Um, people have been very pleased to actually see people, I uh, say, in real life, who a lot of us have met online. Um, and then that's been sort of tempered with, the, as Giles touched on, um, when the slightly atmosphere changed um, with Tobias and so on, you suddenly feel there's an awful lot of anger here, and so there should be. And let's channel that anger and really, you know, well, I know a lot of you are already making a difference, but spread the word and, and let's get more done. Um, but before I pass on, 
Ben, I just want to touch on, I mean, the youth panel, uh, I don't know how many of you are here, um, it really was very touching, um, and listening to the small children. Um, uh, and I think you'll probably agree that the young children almost put the rest of the speakers, I don't know, just been on that panel generally, to shame, that they were so eloquent, they, they sort of put their lines over so, so well. Um, and then finishing off, you know, well, every panel speaker on that, that group was brilliant. Uh, but I think it was a real, uh, it, it definitely worked that we had such a contrast and that um, the emotion in the room and some was, I uh, felt quite palpable. So, thank you all for coming as well. Awesome. I just wanted to uh, say how moved I've been by what we've achieved here, by how many of you are here, and by the commitment and the passion really wanted to make a difference. It's very, very touching. Um, as Jenny has said, Charles has pretty much covered most things, but I've, I've gone for the three C's, which is connections, collaboration, cooperation, and that's with spades today, so thank you to everybody who's contributed. Um, and also I really like the comment in the last session, on, which was about win-win, um, which chimed with the not losing our prosperity, we can do this and still have a good quality of life. Uh, and I've also been heartened, because I've heard in the speaker's corner, about new groups that are now already coming into the fall, and that's really heartening as well. The community groups are really starting to pick up the pace, and that's really good to hear as well. Thank you, Neil. Um, for me, I guess the, the main observation was, I have to be honest, um, I was worried about the workshops. I had a fear that people would stay in this room and they'd be very comfortable, and they'd be happy they could just sit there and listen to speakers and not participate. Those workshops were rammed. I mean, they, and it was hot in there. So if you went to two of them, you came back after you knew how warm it was. Well, well done to you, because that was absolutely baking in there. So but what was good about them, not just that lots of people went to them, but certainly the ones that I was in and I observed, is everyone was taking part as well. So I think the the... The willingness to come here, not just to sit and listen to some interesting people, but to actually contribute, was probably, I think, the thing that, um, for me, has clearly made it, uh, that it's been worthwhile. I'm losing my voice there. <clears throat> um, and one of the things that came out of many of those discussions was the need for us to be careful with our language. Um, and in particular, when we're, not, when we're talking to people who aren't necessarily already clear on the climate crisis. This came out particularly strongly in the justice discussion, where you know, many of the issues we face um, are issues also of social justice and equity, racial justice, generational justice. But often, people who would be our allies aren't necessarily with us because we use language that's very climate focused. And actually, we need to find ways that we can engage with those people, um, not because we have Excuse me. Not because we have a different view, but because we're possibly not using the type of language that brings them with us. So that was something I think that really came through strongly for me today. I think I'm up now anyway, so <laughs> I will just take a drink of water. I think too much talking and the heat today has, um, has finished off my voice. So, it's my job to um, close this session. I think, Colin will correct me, but I think that's a sunrise rather than a sunset. Sunrise, yeah. yeah, so actually, so it's not quite accurate. It is a sunset, but it's the sunset session um, of today, and it's my role to, um, to lead this close. Um, interestingly, this image was a subject of some debate a few months ago, particularly when June, who's been the engine behind our admin for this. Where, uh, Jude, where are you, Jude? Okay, she's probably out doing some work, probably. No, anyway, has been the engine behind the admin for this event. And she said to us, are you really sure about that image? Um, the truth was, we hadn't really thought it through. We'd just been provided by some lovely pictures by Colin. And we all thought, oh, we quite like that one. Poppy Field in Dorset, you know, it's sort of anything. But actually, the more I felt thought about it, um, in some ways it probably is the implications of it are worth, worthy of considering today. I mean, obviously, the implications being that it's tended to be used for remembrance, a requiem. Uh, but maybe on reflection, there is an element of today in which we ought to reflect and remember. Remember those who are already have been affected by the climate crisis, those who are already today being affected by it, and those 
who will be affected by it in the future if we don't take rapid action. Um, it reminded me of uh, this book, the um, cheerfully named Requiem for a Space Species, uh, Why We Resist the Truth About Climate Change. And in it, Clive Hamilton suggests that the central reason, in his opinion, is that we have a system which is hardwired to issues that promote greed, materialism, and alienation. We have this obsession with economic growth, as if that's the only way that an economy can be run for the benefit of all. The focus on the individual that's been the dominant narrative for the past 40 years, where we're meant to look at ourselves and not the communities around us, and a system which has disconnected us from nature. Arguably, that's been going for a couple of hundred years. A system which sees nature not as a common good, but as something to be extracted from, exploited, and dominated. Now, he acknowledges the whole situation is a cause for despair, but he urges us to accept that and then act. And then by acting, we build hope. Now, it seems to me those on the bridge, we talked about them this morning, are wedded too closely to those notions, too closely to the beneficiaries of this system, if not the beneficiaries themselves. They're quite happy to pursue this system, which, as David Harvey, the geographer, calls it, just encourages production for production's sake, accumulation for accumulation's sake. So I'm really pleased to hear in those pledges how many groups and individuals were also talking about not just the things we can do, but the things we can do politically, how we can be lobbying our councillors, how we can be raising the awareness of the issues with our groups. So just those sorts of sessions are the way that we'll build this orchestra, that we'll bring more people in, that we'll make it louder. Because we don't have to accept this status quo. As Arundhati Roy says, we shouldn't just confront it, we should deprive it of oxygen, shame it, mock it with our art, our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliance, our sheer relentlessness and our ability to tell our own stories, what we've been doing here today. Stories that are different from the ones we're being brainwashed to believe. We be many and they be few, they need us more than we need them. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way and on a quiet day I can hear her breathing. And I think at times today, oh, I'm really losing a voice now, sorry, <clears throat> we can hear that coming through. So we remember that as we go back to our daily lives, our work, our school, uh, that we've all got that part to play in that orchestra. We all do different things. We were challenged today about whether we're doing enough in one session, uh, but actually we should be playing to our strengths, going that one step up that Chris Packham encouraged us to do. But remember the hope and positivity is, I think, the key message to take away. Not that, don't focus on that despair, because we faced and addressed major challenges before. Apartheid, equal votes, racial segregation, the Berlin Wall, they all seemed systemic and impossible to overcome until they were. Remember in the 1940s when Britain stood alone, the whole economy was turned over in a matter of months to produce the goods and services that would ensure our shores were protected and our people fed. The scale of industrial output to meet this demand and the focus on communities on what mattered was unprecedented. Without this, arguably, the outcome of the war would have been very different. And it was communities, particularly women, who won the war at home. In the late 1940s, a war-ravaged nation stood weakened and heavily indebted but where the fundamentals of the economy could not be left to the market, the state intervened. Where infrastructure was required, as it is now, it was developed. And despite these challenges, despite that indebtedness, we created the NHS, we built houses for everybody, and we developed a sense that society matters and we work best when we work together for each other. It was ordering working people and communities who decided this was the way they wanted things to be after the war and the depression that had preceded it. So we're well placed to address these crises today if we adopt and go back to and think about how we operated when we faced crises in the past. 189 years ago, I checked, six labourers from Tollpuddle were sentenced to just along the road from here for standing up for what was right. 
I'm fairly sure the current Home Secretary would like to send some of us to penal colonies. But, that's <laughs> it. Um, but maybe from what we commit to today, we can be part, or Dorset can be part once again, of changing that landscape that's so desperate to change, not just for us, not just for the UK, but for the whole world. Thank you for being here, thank you for listening, thank you for what you do, and thank you for everything you will continue doing in the future. Thank you very much. I am privileged to be in a very unique club. It can be no more than five. It's the partners of this gang who have been passive listeners in teams and Zoom calls for the last year and a year and a half while they've planned this, this COP. They've achieved some things that COPs have never done. It's not a soulless place like Catherine described. It's a wonderful place. They haven't run out of water. They haven't fallen out with each other. And they'd almost finished on time. But like all cops, the declaration is still to be sorted out. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's a year to go to the second Dorset COP. Dorchester got there first. Can I ask all of you to join me to thank Giles, Jenny, Colin, Neil and Mark for all their hard work in making that possible. Thank you. Thank you.